So uh, what we're going to be talking about today is um, assessment of second language pragmatics. Go ahead and open. Am I the only one having difficulty hearing uh, Tani? I think me too. It's Maybe not as clear as little it little is little. like every time. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not, you're not coming through clearly. That is odd. How about I don't have any problems. It's fine. It's yeah, fine. I can hear her too. It's okay for me. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Michael, can you hear me well? We can hear you, but just not as well as before, okay. I mean, as well as prior web webinars, put it that way. And I can hear everyone else clearly except you, Tanya. Oh, that is so odd. All right, so let me do something else here and see if it... It sounds like, sense. have you changed uh, hardware at all? Uh, I your... have not. No. Is this better? So, Without well, it? No? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's better. Yes. Yeah, it is actually. Mm -hmm. All right, is that better? Can you hear me well? Yeah. yeah? Okay, perfect. All right, so let me go ahead and start my sharing my screen here. So today's topic is assessment of second language pragmatics. And I have to tell you that second language pragmatics was my first research passion before I became very much interested in assessment. Um, this is actually what I did, uh, what I researched for my master's thesis. And this was something that I thought that I was going to continue researching and doing work on um, for my PhD, but then I met Eddie and then he got me involved into all assessment duties and tasks since 2015. And I was like, you know, I'm very interested in this too. And in a lot of ways, assessment, as, um, assessment issues are more practical and more, I would say even more crucial and more important at this point. Of course, that second language pragmatics is important and I'm gonna advocate for it as well. But I think there was a greater need in terms of assessment, uh, knowledge and application. And so I decided to focus on that for my um, PhD. So we're combining both of my passions here today. And so I apologize if I talk too much. All right, so this is um, our Webinar today is sponsored by ITAP, so thank you very much to uh, ITAP for sponsoring another webinar um, this year. Um, so the first question that I have for you is, what does, an, oops, sorry, what does an individual need to know in order to become communicatively competent in another language? So tell me, okay, so if, you, if you're going to be able to know a language and just say, I know this language, what do you know? Do you know the vocabulary of that language? Like, do you know the words? Yes. Do you know grammar? Yes. <laughs> do you know uh, how to pronounce words in that language? If you say, oh, I know that language, so you know, I know how to pronounce words in that language, right? So when we know lang a language, there are many different aspects of the language that we have to learn in order to become com competent, communicatively competent in that language, right? We need to learn about syntax, we need to learn about lexicon, we, we, we need to know what kind of sounds um, can be made in that language, what kind of sounds are allowed, what kind of sounds are not allowed in phonology, right? Uh, we need to know how words are formed in morphology. We need to know the meaning of words and the meaning of utterances, right? Um, and so if we put all of this together and then we can say that we are in our way to knowing a language and to be able to use a language, right? But there's one important piece missing here. And that is only, actually I can say, not only one important piece missing, there are other pieces missing as well. But if we look at the basics, then we have this and then we have one more piece missing in this puzzle, right? And um, the, the, missing piece, the missing piece in this puzzle is related to being able to use language appropriately and effectively depending on the social context, right? So it's not enough to know how to beautifully pronounce words or how to put words together and construct grammatically correct sentences, right? If we don't know how to use these, um, this knowledge appropriately within the context, within the social context, then the knowledge, uh, we're not gonna be effective communicators in that target language, right? 
Um, and it's important to think about the social context because we change how and what we say depending on who it is that we are talking to or writing to and our relationship to them. So the way that I talk to Maddie as my friend is different the way that I talk to a colleague at work, right? Or is it different from the way that I talk to my boss, right? Where and when the communication is taking place, right? And I'm, if I'm talking to my boss outside of work, am I talking about um, when I'm talking to them, right? Our purpose in communicating, how much we want to share with that person, our attitude and emotional state at the time, and the impression we want to give of ourselves. So we change how we say things and what we say things depending on all of these. And these factors affect the way we say the, the things, right? They affect the amount we're gonna say. They may affect how direct we are. We may not say exactly what we feel. We may lie or be dishonest or omit things. Our language may be more formal or more casual, and we may be vague or we may be deliberately unclear, right? So the social context or the situation affects how we say things, what we say things, and how, what we're doing with it when we're saying, right? And I have to make a pause here and say that when I first moved to the US and I was a student, um, and I had to do start, and I started as a graduate teaching assistant, and I was writing emails in English um, to my coworkers and receiving emails from my boss. I always felt horrible because I always thought that people were being so rude to me when they were just being objective in English, and nobody was saying hugs at the end or nobody saying hi, how are you in an email, and I was expecting that. Uh, coming from a Portuguese language background. And so I thought that people were being, that I had done something wrong, that I was like, oh, like, am I in trouble here? Or, or uh, people were just being uh, rude or, you know, that they didn't have time to talk to me or something like that. So I was, my pragmatic liability in the workplace when I first came to the U.S. had a, a very big mismatch with what I was expecting that would happen. And this has to do with pragmatically, like being pragmatically competent. Um, so in order to be communicatively competent in another language, right, to be able to comprehend and produce meaning appropriately, we need to be able to learn and teach our students pragmatics, right, the way we use, in which we use language in context. Language is a social interaction, is a social phenomenon. You have this co-construct co meaning, right? And so we, not, we cannot just take language as being something completely separate from the social context, from where the language is going to be used, right? So when we know a language, the missing piece of my puzzle in the beginning was pragmatics, right? To use language and the ability to use language uh, appropriately in a social context. The ability to use what to say, where, when, and how, to whom, right? Um, and I think it's funny because I, I've seen this a lot in the literature too. And when I teach pragmatics to my students, they say, teacher, but these are like secret rules of language. Like nobody has taught us this before. Um, or where, where are those unwritten rules? Like, like where can I find those rules? Because they're usually not to be found in textbooks, right? When we're talking about um, uh, maybe like politeness or implied meaning, you don't really see those in our common language textbooks, right? And so students often refer to pragmatics as, oh, the secret rules of language or the unwritten rules of language. And how do we learn those, right? And, how do we, and then again, how do we teach and how do we assess those things, those rules? Does anyone know where we keep the unwritten rules by any chance? Sorry? Does anyone know where we keep the unwritten rules, those secret rules? Where are they? Where are they hidden? Well, uh, they must be in our heads uh, since they're unwritten. <laughs> <laughs> in our heads. So is, what do you mean by in our heads? Do you mean like native speaker heads, non-native speaker heads? No, uh, and, and, and the native speaker's head. Native speaker's head. <laughs> All right, so let's keep going here and then we'll, we'll figure it out. 
So let's talk a little bit about pragmatic ability, right? Before we delve into like assessing pragmatic ability, I think we need, it's important to talk about pragmatic ability itself, right? So when you say, oh, the word, the first time that I, word, that I heard the word pragmatic, I was thinking of the word pragmatic as it is used in a general context, right? About the ability of being practical, right? Um, dealing with things sensibly and realistically, right? More practical than theoretically, but that's elsewhere, elsewhere right? But then when we start talking about pragmatic ability in language and in um, linguistics, right? Usually we correlate pragmatic, pragmatic ability with knowledge of speech act. So basically people just like go ahead and equate pragmatic ability with speech acts. And while yes, speech acts are one dimension of being pragmatically competent, right? It's not all of it. Pragmatic ability involves um, implicatures, involves um, other things that are like um, related to being able to understand implied meaning, politeness, formality, right? That are not only um, speech acts. However, speech acts have been the most researched uh, part of pragmatic ability when it comes to teaching and assessment. So that's why a lot of the book chapters that you see or a lot of uh, the, the, the articles are related to um, speech acts, which are very important, but it's not everything. So we need to take into consideration that there are other dimensions of being pragmatically uh, able um, in another language that involve go beyond just speech acts. Right? Um, when I'm talking about pragmatic ability, right, and talking about um, speech acts, and when I talk to my students about that, and when I want to introduce them, because I think pra introducing pragmatics, talking about speech acts makes a lot easier for students to understand what we're talking about, right? And so uh, some of the things that I uh, use to just like break the ice and ask students to start thinking about what does it mean to be pragmatic ability in a language, right? I give, them, I give them situations. Like, for example, what if somebody gave you an expected gift? What would you say? And if, if this had happened in the language, in the target language, what did you say, right? Someone invited you to go somewhere you didn't really want to go, or somebody complimented you on your new dress or watch, right? You wanted to ask someone to buy you, uh, to do your favor, or you needed to complain about something but didn't want to hurt the other person's feelings, right? Or you hurt somebody's feelings and you needed to apologize. So this gets them thinking about this idea, okay, how can I be socially appropriate when I am uh, trying to do these things, right? Um, and speech acts, while they are universal, like you compliment in every language, right? You apologize in every language. You, um, you make requests in every language. The way that these things are accomplished though are not universal, right? So for example, if you like my shirt today, and then you say, oh, honey, like you, that's a very nice shirt that you have on. If I were speaking Portuguese, I would, my, my, the way that I would accomplish what's coming after this, like instead of just saying thank you, I would probably offer if you wanted to wear it, I won't what I can, you could borrow, right? Or um, I, would, I would downplay it and say, oh, it's like it's old or it's very cheap. Right. So that's how I would accomplish this act of, okay, somebody complimented me, what do I do in response to that? That's how I would do it, right? Um, but not, that's not necessarily what native speakers of English would do when responding to somebody complimenting um, their shirt, right? Or something like that. Or uh, are you going to be more direct or are you going to be more indirect? So starting, uh, get, getting students to start thinking about those things, it helps put them, frame the idea of what it means to be um, pragmatically competent in a language, right? Any questions so far? Are we all good? Yeah, perfect. Um, so the term pragmatic ability in applied linguistics, right? So it's not only about speech acts, it's not only about speaking is not only about producing the language in a communicative way in, in speaking, but it has to do with both receptive skills and both produ and productive skills as well. And oftentimes in the literature, the research is focused on speaking most of the time, like 99% of the time, I would say, it's mostly focused on uh, being able to use uh, language appropriately in speaking, but it has to do with both understanding and producing language. Um, and for, for 
both the reception and production to be a, a successful, right? Um, it it um, has to do with a lot of other factors. For example, our proficiency in the L2, right? However, I have to make a um, parenthesis here and, uh, and say that, uh, sorry, I just, I just got to the chat here. We'll, we'll talk about what, what's in the chat too. Um, so we have to think of in terms of, okay, we have very proficient language speakers, but are they still able to be pragmatic competent? And the answer in the research, and I'm sure that you have had this, uh, you have seen this in your experience, even highly proficient speakers may not necessarily be pragmatically competent in the language, right? So our age, our gender, our occupation, our um, social status, right? And experience in the L2 relevant communities, right? Um, makes a difference when it comes to being pragmatically successful in the language. Um, and like you said here, um, communication across roles can happen with a single person, right? And cultural um, expectations, definitely. So pragmatic ability is often related into, when you, we talk about interlanguage pragmatic ability and we're talking about language, we cannot disassociate that from culture, right? So we're talking about pragmatic ability and intercultural competence as well. So it has a lot to do with social norms. It has to do with culture. Let's keep going. So as listeners, we need to interpret what is said as well as what is not said and what may be communicated non-verbally as well, right? Um, it can provide clues to how polite, how direct or formal the communication is. Um, so this is as listeners. Then as readers, we also need to comprehend written messages, right? And what are the subtle indications of tone or attitude in the communication as well, right? Um, anything from a humorous, sincere, sympathetic, or collaborative tone to one that is teasing, sarcastic, angry, threatening, patronizing, or sexist, right? I still have a lot of trouble like with sarcasm in English. You know, like sometimes it just doesn't translate to me as well as it should. Um, and that speakers, right, we need to know how to say what we want to say with the proper politeness, directness, and formality, and know what not to say at all and what to communicate non-verbally. And we're going to get to why is it important to do that, Harry? Yeah, uh, just a, a stupid question. Uh, my questions are always sort of out <laughs> But uh, uh, on the on non-verbal communication, is nonverbal communication the same across all cultures? Nonverbal, no, definitely not. It's not, okay. Yeah. So a <laughs> smile in one culture is not a smile in another culture. No, right, gestures are not the same. And so that's why it makes it so more complex, right? When we're talking about pragmatics and we're talking about culture, there's so many things that are involved verbally and nonverbally as verbal aspects as well, right? Well, um, I I've probably traveled around the world insulting a lot of people. So um, I, I, I apologize now in front of everyone. Okay. <laughs> and so, and, and that's exactly what we're going to get at. The problem with not being aware of this difference, right, is that um, non native speakers can be perceived as rude when they are not trying to be rude, right? And actually, I have to tell you what actually made me start thinking about pragmatics back in 2010 uh, when I started my master's, or well, 2009, but this happened in 2010. I was in the office um, in our English language center, and one student asked the receptionist that he wanted to use the staple. And he asked, can I use the staple? The receptionist was much older and and then again, we're going to talk about norms and individual variations, but she took that as very rude. And then she put the stapler on the, on, on the desk and said, yes, you may. So she answered with may and not can. And of course, there's a lot of debate there. Like, oh, okay, is may more polite? Yes, but um, it depends on the speakers too, right? And so I saw the puzzled look on the student's face because she looked um, upset when the, the way that he asked, right? And he used grammat grammatically correct construction, pronunciation was fine, but the communication there um, 
broke down at some point, right? And so what I talk to my students about all the time is that we need to learn that we can be perceived as rude even we're not trying to be rude. So if we can learn the language functions to mitigate that, right? And we also need to learn about how to be rude if we want to be rude in the language, right? It's not only about being polite. It's about doing what you want to do with the language. And we can do that very effectively in our first language. But can we do that as effective in our second language, right? Um, and then let's just say here in the chat, I deal with professionalism. My children still find my pragmatic knowledge lacking. I am in, in, in the same way here. I'm still learning. I'm still learning how to like respond to things. And I try to observe as much as how native speakers do it and then try to um, imitate somehow that behavior and try not to take things personally. I, like, I am much less offended now than I was when I first came here with very direct objective emails that didn't even ask me how I, I was, you know. Um, but and Tenny, can I say something? I feel also it's not sometimes just about Pramag, it's also personality because with every person we've interact, now there is this add-on of the person, it's himself or herself, and then so now what may seem nice and polite for somebody else, maybe it's different for this person. So it adds a whole layer of complexity. So I don't think we're ever going to get this down. <laughs> and so can you think about assessing this? Objective? Exactly. <laughs> right? We're going to get there and it just, it just becomes very complicated. But is there a place for assessment and for teaching? Well, for teaching first and of assessment. Yes, there is a place for that. But how do we accomplish that, right? Um, so let's keep going here so we can discuss these issues and see what ideas we can come up with. All right, let's keep going here. And so we have list as listeners, as readers, as speakers, and as writers, right? Um, we also have to be paying attention to the level of politeness, directness, and formalities, right? And formality, as well as considering issues of rhetorical structure, right? So I feel like a lot of the times in class, we are teaching, we're focusing so much on what the task is and rhetorical structure, rhetorical purpose, but are we thinking about, are we teaching our students to pay attention to the word choice in terms of the formality of the words that we're using, right? Um, are we talking about how direct they're being, right? Or how indirect they should be in that particular situation. And I feel like we don't focus enough on that in our classes, right? And curriculum in general and textbooks in general as well. Right? Um, here are a few definitions of um, pragmatic ability and being pragmatically competent in another um, language. Um, so interpreting both implicit and explicit meaning and read those thinking, go ahead and think about assessment and how, how it makes assessment complicated. Right. If we know everything that we know about assessment and about being uh, all the cornerstones of testing, you know, being transparent, being practical, being re at creating reliable and valid assessment. So think about how this adds to the task of assessing. Okay? Um, it deals with language use, language users, and language use settings. So if you think about creating tasks. And you're thinking about different users and what kind of information you have to give to your test taker to make sure that they understand what the setting is, right? So think about that. And we're talking about from the point of view of users, right? The social interactions and the effects their use of language has on other participants. So when we're talking about teaching assess and assessing pragmatics, we're thinking about the consequences of what we say, and especially the unintended consequences, right? Because unintended consequences, when we use the language, it may be for it, it may, and we're gonna get there, it may make somebody less prone to help you because they think that they perceive you as being rude because of how you said things, even if you didn't mean to sound rude or you didn't mean to sound imposing, right? And so it may affect how much a teacher wants to help you. Yeah. Right? Teachers are people too, and we, get, we are affected by how people say things to us. And I have a few examples here to, to share with you today. So what is the big deal, right? Well, the big deal is that second language learners relate the pragmatic knowledge that they have in their first language to the pragmatics of the target language community. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
Sometimes it's transferable, sometimes it is not transferable, okay? So what do you think? Let me give you an example here. A student writes you an email and says, please review the draft and reply me through email by the end of the weekend. I never get those emails. <laughs> you get those emails? All the time. Right? It's aggressive, assertive. Uh-huh. So the student is very likely to come across as rude due to the deadline in position, right? Even though the grammatical structure of the sentence is correct. The professor may also be less willing to give thorough feedback overall based on a judgment of the student's poor use of language in the sense that he or she violated the professor's expectations of such type of interaction, right? Even if just, it's unconsciously oh, speaking. Eric? Sorry, I just want to jump in because I, um, I see so many of these. And um, I, when I saw this first, and I, I mean nothing bad by this, but I want to say, which part of China is the student from? Because it's like a, I can see the direct translation with my knowledge of Chinese, or I'm guessing very much it likely is, number one. And number two, we discussed this in a class just a few weeks ago, and, said, and the student's response to something exactly like this was, but I said, please. <laughs> Exactly. So they think that they're being polite, right? And they're just maybe it's transferring. Maybe it's totally fine to say that in Chinese to be that direct to your professor, but it's not in English, right? And then as as teachers, if even if unconsciously, even if we don't want to, right, we may end up being less willing to help that person, right? Because the interaction didn't go as we thought that it, was, it should have gone, right? And that's the also important the importance of talking about pragmatics to language teachers too. And to anybody who's interacting basically with non-native speakers, because a lot of um, a lot of things can be misinterpreted because of a pragmatic failure, right? Other examples. Have you ever heard something similar? Teacher, you didn't I hate this. You didn't give me the homework assignment. So that's why I didn't do it. Of course I gave you the homework assignment, I gave everybody the homework assignment, right? And now that I chose not to give it to you. Or you need to play the listening one more time. I wasn't able to finish the exercise just by listening to the recording three times, right? You need to, it's the imposition here. Or this one, real, real email that I received. May I ask a question about all these? Mm -hmm. um, not that they're not valid, not that they come across a little rude, um, but have um, what level of students are these? Uh, what's their experience in the US, if they are in the US? And have they been taught um, discreetly some of these um, tools so they can learn the academic communication because one thing is to learn the language for everyday speech and another is the academic culture that's what i see in my university students that they may be proficient in english but they still haven't learned the academic pragmatic aspects of the communication so have they been taught as a question to bring up there are two very important and crucial points here so one Yes, these are these are all students who have been in the United States studying an English center. They're they're trying to get ready to move on to the university, right? Um, and so, no, they hadn't been taught. Uh, I was not teaching pragmatics. These were just like examples that I started seeing as I was teaching here, and I was receiving those um, messages, right? And so it started getting it got me thinking about pragmatics, right? So they know they hadn't been taught. The, exactly how to do these. So these are just messages that students are sending me. And it also is important to mention here that even though they were students immersed in the language here, in the social context, in the culture, pragmatics, this knowledge doesn't come for free, right? It needs to be taught so that they are going to be able to perform well. And then the other point like, but that you are, you are mentioning is that Academic language is a language that everybody needs to learn not in uh, behavior, right? It's not um, a native, non-native speaker right. kind of thing. And so I think um, there's um, Noriko Ishihara and Tony, um, when they're talking about teaching and learning pragmatics, they actually make, it's in my um, 
references, and I love this book, they actually make this distinction about pragmatics that I haven't seen in a lot of other places because usually when we read about pragmatics, we're reading about the, this, this dichotomy, right? Native versus non-native. And what they are emphasizing here, and it's that, um, actually, let me uh, put it to here. Um, they talk about pragmatically competent expert speakers, native or non-native because non-native speakers uh, can be as pragmatically effective as, or in sometimes more uh, so than some native speakers, right? So we wish to depart from this, mis this misleading dichotomy. So both native speakers and non-native speakers need to be taught, when we're talking about academic interaction, they need to be taught the rules of academic interaction as well, right? So I think it, it's, it's, we have to focus a lot on the awareness of it and on explicitly teaching because they are, they are not just like, Pragmatic, you know, like when you say, oh, if you are immersed in the language, you end up learning a lot about the language because of the input that you're receiving at that side of the classroom. But pragmatics, it's not something that is just, it can just be picked up um, if, if somebody's not aware of it. Yeah. And if I may add, I have taught native speakers as well, and I can hear some native speakers saying that to me as well. Um, and so sometimes my non native speakers start modeling or I mean um, replicating what they hear because American students are more direct and they're taught to express their opinions and directly and you know and some non-natives may may have that respect for the academic setting a little bit differently but when they start listening to this they start imitating it and they may come out wrong mm -hmm. so a lot of influence there another layer of complexity yes definitely any other thoughts about this i would just add that i completely agree with the you know native speakers using the same language sometimes to write emails but because i do teach like developmental levels with a mixture of native speakers and non-native speakers and that's a very typical email and so I try at the beginning kind of like to model emails like how to talk to your professors not just me your professors at the college level and then we we have kind of like a practice writing and if I do get this type of email I do write back dear and sometimes I was like please note that you know you're not commanding anybody to, or I would just make a little note sometimes if appropriate, you know, not be offensive, but in terms of like giving feedback to that. And I also sometimes try to emphasize that when I give feedback to them, and this is just specifically writing, they never come across anything negative. So if their emails carry negative meanings, I would, I kind of just like, this is not the feedback you're getting. So we're trying to communicate at the same level. Mm -hmm. So like respect, rapport, and then we all make mistakes. So if I made a mistake for the tardy, then of course I will fix it. But you need to tell me politely that there is a possibility that there was a mistake. Please, I would appreciate if you go check on that. So, and if you do that early on, I've noticed a lot of like smoothening into the emails. But yes, like the previous slide that you had, it, I had a few of those and I could tell the students were really trying to be polite, but the writing was just not polite. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There is this mismatch, right? Yes. And the problem is when they're they're thinking that they're being polite and they're not, right? So we need to make them aware. And I think that's a very good opportunity to teach different language constructions, right? So for example, if you use I was, for example, I was marked absent, right? If you use the passive voice in that case, right? You distance yourself, or if you use the simple past to make a request, right? You're distancing yourself as well. It's teaching the students about the language and teaching students about grammar and teaching students about other ways of communicating something to um, accomplish what they need to accomplish with that, within that interaction, right? So I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to teach grammar, to teach other things as well as pragmatic, right? And teaching them how they are being perceived when they write something or when they say something. Anderson? Yeah, uh, uh, go ahead, Perry. No, 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 no. Oh, please. No. <laughs> I, I was just going to say from an AI standpoint, uh, grading written material such as this using artificial intelligence makes it quite difficult to come up with a 
a good score. I mean, a a, re, a, a, a proper score, I should say. Mm -hmm. So that I, I was just mentioned, just wanted to mention that. Uh, so I, Abdul Samad, you're- Oh you're yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So uh, I, I agree with all of what we are discussing and saying, and also I, I see those emails as a moment for me for teaching and the moments for the students for learning. Mm -hmm. And even like when I approach uh, the idea, I would approach uh, the idea in the class in general sense, if I got like such an email, I would uh, get any identification like information and I would get that sentence which changed the dynamic of the email and made it sound differently. Mm -hmm. And bring that to the class and saying, so guys, and that's, I think, what in a way or another is a good position for me as a non-native speaker of English saying, you know, guys, I learned English like you. So now I let them feel safe. And that even like that student who would at the end, like see the sentence or his sentence or their sentence doesn't feel intimidated. Oh, so I'm not passing this class. So that comes to the student's mind. So, and I would say, I'm like you, I learned English. English is not my first language, but also there is the politeness in writing emails, I know. So they even feel I am, I, I'm not having the defensive sense and I'm not upset rather than celebrating the mistake it happens. Let's learn together. So when they start feeling safe, even if they make more mistakes, they start feeling they are more learning moments rather than intimidating moments to feel, oh no, I, I messed up. Mm -hmm. So I think also like the, the way I, I try to treat and deal with those things in the classroom, even like distancing myself in the class mm -hmm. so they, the student doesn't even feel I was like offended in any way, but I, I would bring that. So if that's read by a professor, that's mm -hmm. that's being understood differently. Mm -hmm. So that helps them and me to teach and they help them to understand. And I, I really appreciate what you said about the awareness, but also the more practice. They Even if they practice like one or two times in the class, it's out of their mind now, like off their minds. And that might happen again. But the idea of like cycling again, I think helps a lot in, from my experience as a learner and as a teacher. Yes. Thank you, sorry, I, I, I took like longer time. No, you're fine, you're fine. And I was thinking here, as you're saying, like even as a native speaker, like that Carrie was saying, I, I, I was probably rude and I didn't know that I was being rude. You can give examples to if you speak other languages, right? And, and you start thinking, right? Oh, should I have been more polite or should I have been more direct? Right? Um, and so why is that important, right? Because there is this failure to perceive this mismatch, right? And so we need to bring awareness. Um, and also because of cross-cultural miscommunication and cultural stereotyping as well, right? And the fact that a learner's grammatical competence doesn't, it doesn't mean that if they have high grammatical competence, doesn't mean that they have high pragmatic competence, right? And so we need to be able to um, teach and tell our students who are more grammatically competent or more proficient in the language, if we put it that way, they also need to learn about pragmatics, right? It's not only the lower levels. However, the ones that are more proficient in the language, they have more language structures in their bag of knowledge of the language that they can deploy depending on the situation. So they would be probably more effective because of that, right? Uh, Tani, let me ask you, does, does language assessment, uh, I don't think, just my experience is language assessment doesn't test pragmatic competence. So it's very rare to see testing yeah. of pragmatic competence, and we're going to see that. Mm -hmm. And I think it should. I think even like standardized tests should test pragmatic competence as yeah. well. Like yeah. if you think about the TOEFL and they're trying to test their ab people's ability to come to the United States and do research and do work and study, I think pragmatic ability is a, comp a component, right? But because it is so subjective and there's so many different things that we're going to look at too here, 
that it's uh, it becomes hard to score objectively, right? And so I think that's why it's not actually assessed. Okay. Um, the other thing too is that speakers act well when they are pragmatically successful. Grammar and other language mistakes are generally overlooked, right? Um, so I think it, that's that's an important uh, asset as well. So is the goal of learning pragmatics, learning how to be polite in the L2? And we already talked a little bit about that. Definitely not, right? The goal of teaching um, pragmatics is to learn the linguistic tools so you can say and convey what you mean, right? If you want to be strong, if you want to be direct, if you want to be vague, right? You can, if you want to derive the very degree of formality of your language, to use what to say and not to say. So as teachers, our responsibility is to give the students the linguistic tools and tell them, okay, this, this if, you, if you're saying this, then this is what's happening. If you're saying that, this is what happened, this is what's happening, right? So by teaching them, right, pragmatic aspects of language, we are helping them become more proficient second language users, a more well-rounded speaker, right, and user of the language. And here is something that I've talked about already about the relationship between grammatical competence and pragmatic competence, right? right. So teaching pragmatics, and we're gonna go very briefly about this um, because I wanna get the assessment. Um, so like Letty was talking about before, it's like SL learners do not just acquire pragmatics for free. It's not something that just happens without any help. Um, and direct instruction can affect it. And this is proved by research, right? Help ESL learners develop with pragmatic competence. And we can expand this to native speakers as well, depending on the context, right? Um, so how can it be taught? And so let's think about how it can be taught and how it can be assessed, right? Um, and if you're teaching with those tasks, you can assess with those tasks as well. So it's important to raise students' awareness of pragmatic differences across languages, right? So you can involve students in discussions in which they learn to explain why, when, and how, and where certain linguistic structures are preferred over others. So like, for example, um, like I said, the passive voice, I was marked absent versus you marked me absent, right? So which one is a stronger, which one is more preferable in this situation? Um, have students interpret the input they hear in actual comprehension. So what does this mean, right? How is this used? What does a speaker who says this hope to accomplish, right? Um, and ask them to match utterances with contexts in which they are appropriate, right? And this can all be transferred into a test as well. And so basically here, it's talking about language, right? And talking about the intended use of the language and why we're doing this. Why is the speaker saying this? What is he trying to accomplish with this? Um, Recognize pragmatic infelicities, right? Like for example, the emails that I showed you, right? So students can, it can be come from examples from them. You can be, it can be some scenarios that you can create yourself, listening activities, certain situations. And of course you have comprehension, recognition and production, right? So ask them to supply some speech acts and semantic formulas. Like what would be best to say in this case, right? You give them the situation, so what would be best, right? Can you now, can you vary the degree of formality? Like, okay, so if you're asking this, if you're making this request to your boss, how would you say it? If you're making this request to a friend, how would you say it? And I often have like students say, oh, I would just like give me this, right? As opposed to, could you please give me that? Or would you mind, right? So, and then after that, discuss perceptions of the language um, and speakers of that language based on the choices that they make, right? And make conscious choices. I think that's the most important thing. You're, you're teaching your students to make conscious choices about the language, okay? And so let's talk about assessing specifically, right? So would you agree with this, that the purpose of assessing L2 pragmatics is to test L2 use in real world settings, in real world context? What do, what do you think? Yes. You think, you think so, Mike? 
I do. Everybody else? So we're thinking about real world authentic. So we're thinking about assessment, we're thinking about authentic assessment, right? We cannot just like get, have chunks of language separated from a context, right? And that creates a lot of other things to think about uh, when we're thinking about assessment, right? Um, and why do we need to assess? We're teaching, but why do we need to assess students? Well, it sends a message to the students that their ability to be pragmatically appropriate is valued or even advantages, right? Remember, like if you're teaching something and you're not assessing it, you may be sending a message, whatever it is, whatever the topic it is. If you teach something and you don't assess it, if you don't bring that into a quality assessment, you're sending a message to the students that that may not be important. They don't need to focus on that because they relate, okay, it's, if, is this gonna be on the test? If it's not gonna be on the test, I'm not gonna worry about it, right? That's usually the mentality. It shouldn't be, but it's usually the mentality. And it also gives an opportunity to see the relative control their students have in what may at times be a high stakes area for L2 performance, like getting a job, like an interview or something like that. So it is uh, an important area of performance in the target language, right? Communicating with the professor and so on and so forth. I mean, this fits really well. Like imagine that they're doing like a role play or they're doing a discussion so that they have questions. There needs to be like turn talking and, you know, agreeing or disagreeing. So that's where it comes out. So it's not about what they say, but how they say so they don't, you know, make an argument or being rude because that's, I mean, we help students to function within, like with other people within society. So if that is not accomplished, then it's just like, here is a book, just do it by yourself and just, you know, repeat those words and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, I think that it's part of the whole package, basically. Exactly. And if, if you think about it in a workplace, you're not only in an academic setting, right? You're right. Discussing with, with your colleagues, you're going to be in projects, right? And if you are rude, disagree, I like completely disagree with you or something like that. You know? Right. You're not teaching ways of students to do that. Right? It's, that's important as well. So when we are assessing, you, we want to include productive and receptive skills. And tests, of course, will measure comprehension and tests that will measure production. Usually with lower level learners, you can do a lot more comprehension tests, right? Testing the receptive skills, like do they think this is appropriate or not if they don't have enough language to produce, right? You can start right from the beginning and see with, um, if, they, um, if they think it is appropriate or not and have discussions about that. So measuring comprehension, you're requiring learners to judge somebody else's language, right? Um, they have to assess how well they think someone else has performed, how appropriate the interaction looked or sounded. So that, I think the key word here is how appropriate it is, right? Learners can be shown a scene from a movie, a videotape role play, a written description, right? And ask what they think, right? So for example, this is an example from a book here. Uh, you give uh, just a little bit of a context. The class assignment is due. Hassan hasn't finished yet. He wants to ask his teacher for an extension, right? I cannot finish the assignment. Can I finish and bring it to your office tomorrow? And then you, uh, uh, you indicate with an X how you would rate the appropriateness. And then we have to talk about this, like what may be appropriate for somebody may not be appropriate for another person. So we have to think about that when we are assessing, right? Um, Excuse me, is this something you give to the students? Because this is very subjective as well. It is very subjective, exactly, yes. So these are the kind of discussions that you want to bring into the classroom, but then you have to be, and we're going to talk about the challenges, that you have to be very careful when you're going to score this. And one way to actually score a pragmatic assessment uh, when we're, we're looking at the research is to allow students to give you, give the students the opportunity to explain why they chose instead of just checking, oh, I don't think that this is appropriate. Why? You explain the, um, give students an agency and, uh, and um, they tell them like they, they can explain to you um, why they think it is appropriate or it is not appropriate because it is very subjective, right? Another thing also with the example that mm -hmm. if I might change, is the student name because a, stu a student name can entail a culture. So mm -hmm. I would just put student, student or a teacher or a student and a peer. So in that way, so no culture is in any way entitled or included. Mm -hmm. 
uh -huh. because then we think about cultural uh, stereotyping, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, we would assume Hassan is being uh, very pushy. You know that. <laughs> oh, and they don't do it yet, right? Or, or there are no firm answer. <laughs> and then you would have to measure production, right? How well they produce, right? And this can go from more controlled or more extended language production, right? Those course completion tasks are very much used when we're talking about uh, assessing or and teaching pragmatics. For example, like this, right? Uh, and you give a scenario, and then you ask the students to say what they would say, right? So your professor was giving a very complicated lecture and he didn't do the reading beforehand, so he had a hard time understanding it. You go up to him after class to ask for a clarification on key points, right? Um, so you knock on the professor's office door, the teacher says, yes, come in, and you say, hello, Mr. West, what would you say, right? So these are very common tasks for uh, teaching and assessing pragmatics, right? To see if they are going to be culturally appropriate. But you see here that you have um, a scenario, you have the social context, you have the people who you're talking to, right? And your relationship to them. Um, so let's talk about the challenges because I think that this is like, this is the biggest thing when it, when it comes to talking about assessing pragmatics, right? Um, And I think number two here, it's not in particular order, but like construct operationalization. Like what is exactly that your time, what is the construct? So you have construct validity in your test, right? And need to use language in highly contextualized situations, right? Um, traditional ways of testing often reflect past models of teaching and learning. So even though we may be moving forward with our teaching, a lot of the times our testing, it does not conform to our teaching, right? In terms of what we believe language ability is, right? So if you, for example, if you believe that language is socially constructed, right? And you give a, a test that is just fill in the blanks with uh, sentences that are not connected to each other, there's no scenario, there's nothing, then you're testing in a way that is different from what your beliefs are about what it, be, what it means to know a language and to be able to use it. Right. And we hear you for example, um, that the contextualized instances of pragmatic use too. So it has the, the social context is very important. And that what it, it's a lot of words here, but what is what I wanted to focus on is that keeping a pragmatic test practical in terms of designing, scoring, and administration is quite challenging, right? And that goes back to what we were saying. Implied meaning and social appropriateness of a certain linguistic choice can be very subjective, very context dependent. Learners need to be provided with enough context to be able to judge whether a particular response is adequate or not. The same is true for scoring the student response, right? You have to have a lot of creativity and thinking on the part of the teacher to develop just one item, right? And this, the teacher may still fail to provide enough context, and the student may interpret the item in a completely different way than you thought they would interpret the item, right? And without a way to explain to the teacher what his or her thought process was, it may be hard to judge, right? So there's a lot that it goes into creating a fair, reliable, and valid assessment of pragmatics, right? Tony, I think uh, commercially, the reason you have not seen it is uh, that I don't think uh, commercial companies such as mine could figure out how to sell it, even though we, we could say it's very important. I could say, uh, you know, the for example, a TOEIC, and we have a, a, my company has a business test too, but it doesn't include, uh, doesn't include pragmatics, mm -hmm. uh, I can assure you. And uh, I think it's very important. I think you've made a great case for it, uh, but it, no matter how important I think it is, I don't know how I would sell it to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, I probably wouldn't do it, even though it's important. Right? Hmm? It's very subjective. The norms yeah. of the language vary, right? So should it be included in front of those tests or should it only be part of the classroom? Yeah. That's yeah. That we need to have as well, right? Yeah. Um, norms vary, right? It's a healthy degree, right? It's a norm, not a rule. Um, 
so we should always be encouraging our learners to discuss where they're coming from when we're teaching and assessing. Um, and then before we assess, then we need to further understand what is that, what it is that it should be taught, right? Are we focusing on speech act? Are we focusing on inquisitors? Are we focusing on politeness, um, degrees of formality, right? Because then we can define the content and we have we can have content and construct validity, right? If, because then we may be testing something that we are not aiming to test. So we need to be um, taking, need to take that into consideration. Teachers need to be educated as well and being explicitly taught, which is not always the case in a lot of master's programs, PhD programs, we are not often exposed to this, right? And then lack of this type of knowledge about pragmatics and language assessment literacy may lead to avoid uh, to avoidance of testing those aspects of language use so they can go hand in hand. But teaching and assessing pragmatics can increase students' confidence in using the target language and can engage students in the process of learning other linguistic features and forms to perform different language functions. So do I advocate for it? Yes, I strongly advocate for teaching pragmatics, raising the students' awareness and bringing that into your classroom in the form of teaching and in the form of assessment. But if we're doing assessment, then we have to be very careful to make sure that we are being fair, that we are testing what we meant to test. And also that another thing that is very important to bring up is that pragmatic knowledge may be learned elsewhere. You don't, you don't, the development of pragmatic knowledge in the target language is something that happens over time. And so it may be something, it may not, you may not be testing something that was actually taught. You may be testing something that a student actually knows already because it's a developmental process too. So we have to be very careful when it comes to assessing pragmatics. So I don't know, and I wanna bring um, that to you. I don't know if um, we want to bring assessment of pragmatics in a summative way or something that would definitely impact their grades, or if we want to do more in terms of formative assessment in the classroom, because it's something that they need to learn, something that they need to know, right? But what do we want to do with that and how we're going to go about it, it also depends on how well we can construct the tests, right? Any other thoughts that you have? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about uh, like assessing pragmatics and uh, also in a way or another, it's. It's not a common one, but the idea that came to my mind is uh, to help the learners or even like test takers to see what is the outcome or a consequence of poor use of pragmatics. For example, I can, I can give a scenario of two employ employees, for example, uh, uh, applied for like promotion. And they give the scenarios and they say, one of them got the promotion and the other one didn't get it. Why do you think so? Look for the keys in the language. So in this way, it's backward, a kind of a backward analysis rather than bottom up analysis. So they see, oh, why did that? And then even like there will be a lot of claims, oh, maybe that person is working harder. Oh no, actually they're both the same. So I try like a kind of narrowing the students focus or test takers to, I mean, test takers, it might be a little bit challenging, but the learner's aspect into it's in those sentences, not out of, it's not out of that. Mm -hmm. So in this way that I, I feel will help them to think, oh, okay, now I get it. That that like request was very direct. Ah, okay. So, and then even like enhancing again, the pragmatic aspects of the language in more outcome results, consequences, backward analysis. Mm -hmm. So you focus on the language aspect only. Right. Yeah. If all else is similar. Let's look at the language, right? And see. Definitely. Um, here. And so I wish we had more time to discuss about this, but uh, we don't. Uh, 
I think it's, it, it brings a lot of discussion into both teaching and, and, the, and the, the role of teaching and the role of assessing pragmatics. There's a lot of stuff here in the chat of like taking the turns or taking like learning how to take the floor, right? Is this part of pragmatics? You could, you could say it is part of pragmatics as well. So I think there is definitely a place for it in the classroom. And it's definitely something that we should be teaching and assessing our students. But like I said, we need to think about it a lot more. And there a lot of more, a lot more research has to be done because I don't think there's enough research explaining exactly how to do it. Um, and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of creativity. It takes a lot of thinking. And then if we go, when we go back to teachers having a lot of time, that's not, that's, we don't, right? We don't have a lot of time to create our assessments and to teach and to prepare our lesson plans. And so this adds a lot more uh, on the part of the teacher as well. So I hope you enjoyed um, today's webinar and please feel free to email me. I'm gonna send you an email with more resources. If you have more ideas, and I know we didn't have a lot of time to discuss today, but if you do have more ideas and you want to start a thread in my email and talk about those things, I would love to hear what your thoughts are. And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna share more resources as well. I would also once more like to thank, uh, thank ITAP uh, for sponsoring our webinar today. And it's really interesting to see also the perspective of, okay, how do you sell? Like, how do you promote this aspect of language ability and bring that into standardized testing as well? Is this something that it, one, we wanna do? Is it something that we don't wanna do because of many other reasons, including one of them? is can we sell this and can we make people understand what this is, right? And so I think there's a lot of important discussions here and I wish we had tons of hours to talk about that. So please feel free to comment as well um, on, um, uh, on the email and then bring your thoughts uh, into the discussion as well. And thank you very much for joining today. Honey, do you send the slides around to everyone? Uh, yes, I, mm -hmm. yes I will send my slides as well. This is this is really, uh, I found it very interesting, exciting. Uh, I've come up with uh, several things that I might want to do my, uh, with my company. And I, uh, I must say it's an area that has is, is been overlooked and should not have been. And you brought this to, at least to us who joined you, it brought it to our attention. And we thank you. I thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. And this is something that I'm thinking about all the time. So like, how do you bring that into your tests? You know, I do want to bring like have a whole test about assessment, pragmatic, or do you want to do more? Or do you want to include that into your own tests? Right. So I think there, there's a lot of discussion there. So thank you very much. And I will fascinating stuff. Thank materials. you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, a pleasure. Bye. 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 Thank you, Tanya. It was a pleasure. Yeah. I actually did my um, my master's dissertation was on Rover's um, test that he did on the computer. I did it on paper um, in Taiwan uh -huh. and with implicature and uh, which speech acts and a multiple choice test. And uh, I thought it was interesting also in Grabowski's article talking about, um, you know, it's a problem is like with the uh, fill in the blanks. I think you know, it was actually like slide number 44. <laughs> like, I just, I was looking at that one, but it was like the fill in the blanks kind of thing, like um, Rover's test. But the problem was you can get a lot of different answers that are okay. Mm -hmm. And then I was with my niece and nephew who niece just graduated from university. Nephew's a sophomore at university. A couple of things they said, I was like, what, what? Like, you know, it's the, the new younger people language that, you know, <laughs> folks yeah. like, well, I say folks like me, I, I don't know what they're talking about necessarily, but it was probably a perfectly fine um, response pragmatically, but I didn't even know in my native language what they were talking about, Florida language or something of 20-year-old surfers and uh, fishermen yeah. rather than like, you know, 50-year-old dude that <laughs> teaches students sort of thing. And, you know, anyway, but very fascinating. I'll, I'll be sure to, uh, I think back in January when you posted these, I was like, I can't wait till this one. I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to this. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah, just like one comment. Oh, sure. Related to that, I was also thinking about something that some, a teacher told me once. Depending on if you've had more female teachers of that target language and male teachers of that target language, oh. young teachers of the target language, older teachers. And then oh, yeah. Like, what are, what, are, what are you teaching your students, you know, as a female or as an older mm. person, as a younger person? You know, yeah. what are you teaching at your age, like your students, right? Versus mm -hmm. what, what are people saying, right? Definitely. 
And then I hear how they sound. Okay, I, I sound like an old woman in that language <laughs> because that's how I learned it, right? I, I learned my Chinese tones. My first teacher was female. And so her first tone was kind of a high one. So I was saying something like, hi, like that sort of equivalent in English. And it, finally, um, my wife at the time, my girlfriend said, you don't have to do it that way. You sound very strange. Like, oh, I get it. And um, another thing that I thought was with politeness is very interesting. Um, at family meals, back when we, I was living in Taiwan, we would visit my, as a fiance or girlfriend, we were visiting my wife's family. And I would say, xie xie, thank you to my, um, to my wife's mother. But one day my wife said to me, like, don't say it as much because you're actually putting distance between you two. You're treating her like you would a waitress or some, or a waiter in the restaurant. And I'm like, I'm saying thanks to my mother-in-law, our future mother-in-law. I think I'm doing the right thing. Instead, I'm pushing her away. It was too polite, or it seemed like too polite, but that taking it from your native language, as you well know, as a non-native speaker of English, that's like really frustrating. You think I'm being polite to this person I want to impress. I'm doing the opposite. <laughs> anyway, right. you can see how I feel about this too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tani, do you, do you know of any assessment exams that are out there that do this? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, what I would see, uh, I'm talking to you, I wouldn't talk to the whole group about this, but uh, I could see my company, because uh, you can't sell it. I mean, no, you because nobody understands, they don't typically, but you can, uh, you could put it, uh, I, we could uh, put that in our tests that, uh, that's a giveaway. You know, that, uh, you know, if you're a company and you're hiring, uh, businessmen who are going to be doing business all over the world, mm. then you ought to have them take this test and see how well they do, because they could very easily insult someone on the phone, no matter how fluent they might be in English. And uh, so it's just sort of a, a yeah, I, I, that's why I, I wanted you to send me the slides, because I want to talk to uh, to Chris about it. Uh, uh, because, But commercially, I don't, even though I think it's important, I don't know how the hell you sell it. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. And it, it leaves a lot of room for people arguing. It's like, oh, I, I think this is appropriate. Even like native speakers can say, I think this is appropriate. I think this is appropriate. I think your answer, so how do you objectively score something like that in a high stakes mm. test? Yeah, yeah. Like test, right? So I don't, I, as far as I know, I don't know any of any tests that actually directly assess like medics. Yeah. My colleague from uh, New Jersey, outside of Philadelphia and I growing up in the Midwest in a small resort town, we, we discussed some of this with a class about like what was some pragmatics and what was okay. And she's like, no, that's totally fine. I'm like, oh God, I would not do, I would not say something in that manner, but mm -hmm. um, you know, joy, joy easy versus like, you know, Midwest, you know, sure. you know, like Min Michigan, Minnesota sort of, you know, aspects of way of looking at things. It's kind of, yeah, even with native speakers, but There's anyway, I should say goodbye, to, but yeah. um, I've got to get the kid to the baseball game, but great to talk to you both. All right, thank you very Bye. much. Thank you very much, yeah. Tani, thank you, it was very good, very interesting. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Sarah. I'm gonna send right now all, all the materials. All right. Bye.